Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Most righteous and eternal Father, our God and our Savior, our King eternal, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, the mighty God of Daniel. We give you thanks that we have gathered here today, Lord, another blessed and holy Sabbath day, a day, Almighty God, that you have set apart that we can come to worship you. The first Sabbath in the Roman calendar here according to the number of days. Oh, praise be to God. We pray that as we have come, Lord, to honor you, that we will truly be consecrated, that we will truly be given ourselves to thee. And so we pray today, Lord, that you will dwell and feel free to dwell in the midst of us, that you will consecrate us, that the spirit of worship, the spirit of praise, and the spirit of thanksgiving may truly be upon each and every one of us. That we may give you acceptable worship. For one year has passed and a new year has come. And it is said, Lord, it's a 2020 vision. But we pray, Almighty God, if you should return in this year, that we may see you eye to eye. We ask you, Lord, that you may give us strength to overcome. Oh, there are signs and signs of the time and the nations, Almighty God, gathering themselves for the day of the God Almighty. We pray you'll bless the one who will break the bread. We pray you'll bless the one who will lead us, Lord. We pray you'll bless the choir, the musicians. We pray you bless this entire service, each and every one that gather here today. Remember the rest of the church. Remember Israel. Remember Jerusalem. Remember Jacob's children. Have mercy upon us, we pray, as we tell you thanks for all these mercies, all you will be doing, and all that you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is good, and he always will be good. And so as we have started this new Roman year, I want us to start our praise and worship with this particular chorus, thinking about his love and his goodness that has brought us through the year that was past and will take us through the year that is ahead of us at this time. Amen.
for what he has done for us what he has done for us not what we have done for him because we can't do nothing for God but what he has done for us amen amen let's just magnify the Lord Is home. 
find very wonderful about that is that I can call him all that and that he has been faithful to me and that he has been a healer to me and that he has been righteous to me and he has been all that to me and so we're going to close we're not going to stay much longer but we're going to sing a song that everybody should know everybody should know I sang it for somebody and they say oh yes I know that song and so I would like you to sing that song with me as well and the song is basically a song that we should love and know and we should have no problem with because it goes on with the faithfulness that we said we're going to talk about today sing about today deal with today and deal with every day of the year and it is forever God is faithful so if you don't know that one I don't think we have a problem because I'm just going to ask you to clap to that song that's all if you don't know the words of the song and if you don't want if you see the words but you don't want to sing it still clap that's the only thing that you need to do
the Lord a wave offering, brethren, whether you're seated or you're standing, just give him a wave offering. Forever he has been faithful to us. Amen. We bless the Lord. You may be seated. Just want to give thanks for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. I can join with each of you to say he has been faithful to me. Amen. Bless the Lord. Today is one of those Sabbaths that most persons look forward to the beginning of another Roman year. And we're in the house of the Lord, doing what he requires of us, assembling ourselves in his courts and giving him praise and glory and honor that is due to him and none other. Amen. We bless the Lord. I just want to use the opportunity to welcome each and every one of you who is here in the sanctuary today that the Lord has spared and has placed on your hearts to be in his house. It's really good to see you all and I can assure you that a blessing awaits you for being here. Amen. Bless the Lord. I want to acknowledge my bishop who is up here with me on the Rustum Bishop Chambers. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here serving with him at this time. And his dear wife, sister Daisy Chambers, who is in the congregation. So Daisy, for those who might not know you, can you just wave your hands? Sister Chambers, yes, that's her across there. I want to acknowledge my pastor, Pastor Roach, who is also in the congregation. Greetings, Pastor. And his dear wife, Sister Roach, who is sitting across here in blue. Can you just raise your hand, Sister Roach, so that the congregation can see for those who do not know you. It's really good to be able to worship with the people of God. We have in our midst Pastor Stewart. Pastor Stewart, just wave your hands. Yes. And we have our deacons in our midst. I'm seeing about three of them. Deacon Henry, Deacon Thompson, and I saw, yes, Deacon Riley, I'm seeing you. Yes, wave your hands. Yes, welcome into the house of the Lord. And to our praise ministers who allow the Lord to use them in the way he did. I just want to greet you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And thank you, musician, for your contribution to the day's worship. The Lord bless you. And for our viewers and those that are viewing us presently and for those who might be viewing later on, I just want to use the opportunity to say welcome to today's worship. And to our technical team who makes all this possible, I just want to greet you in a special way today. Brethren, each and every one of you, from the eldest to the youngest, for those who are visiting for the first time, I'm seeing some faces that um, might be visiting for the first time. For those who have been here before, I want to say a warm welcome to you and ask that you give what you have bought here to give to the Lord, your praise and your worship. And don't let anything or anyone stop you from praising your God because he is indeed worthy to be praised. Amen. Bless the Lord. I'm going to invite you now to stand and turn with me in your hymnals to hymn number seven. The church is one foundation and a member of the praise team will lead out this song for us. Thank you. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation, by water and the Thank you. 
yes, that's who we are. And the theme for today, it will be speaking to the church, the body of Christ. The theme is the church of God, the body of Christ. And we will hear more about that later. But we just sung and reaffirmed some things we already know about the church of God. It has one foundation and it's Jesus Christ, her Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. Now we're going to go into our offertory. I know that we came bearing our gifts to offer before the Lord. And so now I ask you that you reach for those gifts and Deacon Thompson will lead us in this part of service. We bless the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord for this new calendar here, the first Sabbath. And I give a lot of thanks that I'm feeling strong. I don't know what percentage I have, but I'm feeling very strong. And we all hope that we have the strength of the Lord and we are renewed every day. Amen. This is our offertory service. And I wish to just read a scripture for you to support our service. It's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16. And it states, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord, thy God, which he hath given thee. So you have to give according to the blessing and according to your ability. So give as the Lord has given to you. Now the ushers come forward at this time. We invite you to stand. I invite you to stand everywhere for the arms for the Lord's blessing and the tithes and offering to be collected from His people. May those who can stand, stand at this time. And we'll just pray. Most righteous of all us in God, our Creator, our Protector, our Keeper, here we are, O God, giving you thanks and praise for everything. We thank you, O God, for the sunshine. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for each and everything that you have done for us. That we can stand here today and that we can come into your courts. As we come, O oh God, we come with a mind that we can give unto you that which is belonging unto you. You have given us ability. You have given us a blessing. And may we in turn give back unto you that portion which belongs unto you. May, O oh God, bless each and every one that we gather here today. May you bless the offering that should be collected. May you multiply it. May we cause it to be used for the furtherance of your record on earth. And may you continue to bless us and keep us. As we give unto you that which you are able to give unto you. May you bless each and every one. Bless everyone. Bless us for the day so to go forward. May you keep them. May you strengthen them. May they come to the service for you in your house. And may your God bless us all. On and all, we give you thanks and tell you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. With the mission of your selection for the day's tithe and offering is collected.
Lord has been good to you, man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The song says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Which one, which one of us would have received a token or a gift? And we appreciate the gift and not say thank you. And even if we forget, then we have to go back and say thank you, right? Oh, in my joy, I forgot, but thank you. So brethren, we're here to say thank you to the Lord today. Amen? Because he is good. Amen. I must say thanks to Deacon Thompson for leading all the offertory and to our musician for ministering in music. Amen? Bless the Lord. In my class today, um, we learned about the spoken word. Well, it wasn't the spoken word. It was the, the written word and the living word, right? So the living word was is Jesus and the written word is the scriptures. And later we'll have the spoken word which you will be able to tell me what that is later on, right? Okay, I look forward to hearing that. But now we're going to have Sister Wilson. She'll be doing the written word. She'll be reading the scripture for us. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. Sister Caritha Wilson. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. Happy Sabbath, brethren. Please stand with me while I read today's scripture reading. Matthew 16, verse verses 13 through to 20. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed. Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. No, I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Here ended this portion of reading. Thank you, Sister Wilson. Um, later on, we'll hear more about that scripture so don't lose the page mark it yes we're gonna have our special selection at this time and we have among us a very special sister who has availed herself to minister to us in song I'm going to invite her to come at this time and she's none other than sister swell the only wise God, we give him all glory and all honor. I was asked to do a special song, but I didn't get through with the song. And my dear pastor gave me a song. But, <laughs> but while I turn in the book, my eye focus on 179. I don't know it. I don't know the ear, but that is what my eye focus on. To the grandest team, to the easy song, 
is the grandest team for a mortal tongue. It's the grandest team that the world should sing. That our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. That's but no by sin oppressed. Go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee to the grandest team, to the world of strength. This the grandest team for mortal strength. This the grandest team, tell the world again, our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin no press, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. This the grandest team, let the tide in roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, He will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. Yes, He is able. To deliver thee, my God is able to deliver thee. Though by sin or prayer, go to him for it. My God is able to deliver thee. Yes, he is able. He is able. My God is able to deliver thee. We bless the Lord. Do you agree that God is able to deliver you? No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the challenge is, just trust Him and He will deliver you that's a message in song all by itself God is able to deliver you we bless the Lord hallelujah we serve a great big wonderful God I heard so many names this morning and he is able the faithful God we serve comes through every time sometimes we think he's late but he's just in time He's able to deliver you and me. Amen. Bless the Lord. At this time, we're going to invite our bishop to come forward. And I'm sure that he'll be bringing a word that can enlighten someone or others as to how they can be delivered. Amen. Brethren, please stand for me and receive our dear Bishop, the man of God, who the Lord has laid the word on his heart to deliver to us today about the church of God, the body of Christ. Bless the Lord. Okay, brethren, you may be seated. Happy Sabbath to your church. Trusting God for His continued direction and His leading over our lives. It's a privilege to be here with you. I take the opportunity to thank Him for my spirit life. I've recognized over the last couple of weeks that my voice has been changing, so I recognize that age has now taken its impact on my voice. 
And so, with that in mind, I have to be conscious and therefore conserve on the chords that enable the sounds to come forth. Thank God for all of us today. I thank God for our moderator. It's a privilege to share with you. You said it was a privilege to share with me. Well, it is also a privilege to share with you. Not very often we have sisters moderating the services. Well, when I'm here. So I'm happy that you're here with me. Recognize all praise ministers. And I ask you to pray for Tudy. Because as much as you see her there, she's in pain. She's never without pain. And so I can understand the challenges that she might have been experiences, experiencing this morning. Or this afternoon. So we continue to pray for her. A lot of persons, if they were experiencing the pain levels that she's experiencing, they wouldn't be out of church. So I'm really happy that she's here. To the musicians, I really thank you for being here with us for sharing in this our Sabbath worship Pastor Roach it's good to see you it's a privilege sharing with you my brother and I'm happy to be serving here today trust that you and your wife have a wonderful Sabbath that you continue to enjoy good health. Also recognize Pastor Stewart. It's good to see you, Pastor Stewart. It's good to see our deacons. Deacon Riley, Deacon Henry, Deacon Thompson. Not in any special order, but it's so such a wonderful experience to share with all the deacons those other officers of the church board I greet you I greet all visitors it's good to see brother blue it's good to have you with us today it's good to see sister Heather so delight to be sharing with you it's good to I never like to do these things but I must recognize Deacon Williams brother Williams brother Williams has been one of the most active members in our Wednesday services and I just can't go on without recognizing his contribution to the prayer and fasting services of this congregation so brother Williams Thank God for you. We recognize our children, all other officers, and friends, those on the technical team, those might be watching us. I greet you in the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Messiah the Christ. I wish to share with us today on a theme which when I was trying to thank the Lord over the last couple of weeks I've been put, helping me to put this thing together and I would claim that maybe part of it is mine, other part is his but the whole influence of the Holy Spirit through him, through me as a love for the word so today I wish to share with us on a very unique topic, I call it unique it is the church of God dash the body of Christ the church of God body of Christ let us pray merciful loving God we thank you thank you for your love and your mercies pray you will challenge our hearts today as we speak as you speak through me Encourage your people. May we live lives pleasing in your sight. We ask these mercies in Jesus' name. 
As I said to you earlier, the theme I wish to share with us on today is the church of God, the body of Christ. I was sitting next door to um, Daisy. Sister Daisy, good to see you. I remember I was talking to somebody this morning and they asked me, is Sister Daisy going to church today or is she staying home? Because she has been experiencing very severe pains over the last couple of weeks. But Sister Daisy is strong. And the Lord is going to continue to keep her. So I was saying to her when I heard all the discussion this morning that I tried to steer away my thought processes from the immediate discussions that were taking place and Pastor Roach was encouraging it to a great extent. Because what I really wanted to speak on based on the word of God was around a lot of the thoughts that were expressed this morning. And so I'm sure that when I'm through, all the thoughts that you would have expressed, or most of them, would have also been captured in my presentation. And then, I was, Daisy said to me, well, don't worry, preach them. And so I thought that I would just come up here and say thanks for preaching this morning, and then I'd come down. But then afterward, I think it was she who said to me, if what you're saying is being echoed elsewhere, it means that one or two weaknesses, you must say the word. So I, I wish to to share. The establishment of every organization is very important. The establishment of every organization is important. When we, when I came to Kingston about 1969, I remember that there was that grand old lady of North Street, the Gleaner Company. And a lot of people associate longevity of an organization with the Gleaner Company. And it had its own objectives. It was coming out of a visit to the Gleaner Company in the where the binding was done that I recognized that the Gleaner had in its own visions as to what it wanted to, to do with news. I also begin to recognize that all companies have a vision. I remember I did a study of the DNG and the DNG has a very robust vision of its organization to the point at that time it was Mr. Geddes and Denos. Well, Denos had passed on, but Geddes was around. And he purposed that if he's going to die, he's going to transition the company to some other organization to some other organization or person because he want DNG to still live. And so after he died, DNG still continued to live. So although you're drinking DNG and all of that, the, old, the original owners are no longer around. And I spent a little time looking at the text that was read and look at our own existence as a church. And I begin to recognize that our name did not come by accident. I'm not going to go to all the texts in respect to that. But there are more than six places in the Bible where the phrase, the church of God, is used. And there are more than, and that's in the New Testament. And there are more than four places in the New Testament where the phrase, the body of Christ, is used. And I've come to recognize that a number of churches, a lot of persons are now talking about being a part of the body of Christ. 
I, I had nothing to do with this. I only came in as a regular member. But the Church of God, the Body of Christ, is a very, I think, noble institution. It has a mission and it has a vision statement. I'm sure that a lot of us don't know the mission or the vision statement for this church. But what is a mission statement? A mission statement is really to help us to achieve our vision. It's a step. I, a mission is like the lunch room. And I want to get to the lunch room so I'll have to go to the staircase. And each rung of the step that I climb is going to aid me in getting to the lunch room. And so the mission of the Church of God, Body of Christ here at Windward Road is the Church of God, Body of Christ is committed to enhancing the spiritual growth of members and bringing others to salvation through Christ by ministering and righteous living. I think it should be out there. The church also has a vision statement. The vision is how we're going to get where we want to go. And the vision, the vision of the vision statement of the church is it is an assembly of believers where everyone can find love. And I heard a discussion this morning, the brokenness. So everyone should be able to come in here and find love. Not only that, everyone should find acceptance. There should be hope. There should also be forgiveness, guidance, and fellowship through the various programs and auxiliary groups which are geared towards helping them discover their God-given talents. It's a long thing. But that is the vision of the church. And so our church here has been predicated or sorry, its vision and mission have been predicated on getting broken lives together. And by the way, when I had the Lord spoke to me in this regard, I did not even see the lessons for this week. So we therefore then ask a question, what is a church? Well, we know what the NG is, we know what the Greener Company is. What is a church? I want to declare to us today that the church has a vision and the church has an objective. If we, if we go to the book of John chapter 4 and verse 22, I'm not going to draw your attention, I just want to note. The Bible says that salvation is of the Jews. And so when we consider the church and we look at the genesis of the church, we have to begin to recognize that there is something inherent with the way we worship, the things we do within the body, and how it impacts the Jewishness of the, the Bible. Because we are told that salvation is of the Jews. One of the questions that we ask ourselves very often is, do Gentile Christians become Jew on account of their relationship with Jesus? So if you're a Gentile, do you become a Jew by your relationship with Jesus? We ask the question sometimes, do the church somehow replaces the Jew or the Jewish people in God's plan? And so the church is now the new Israel. Or thirdly, because I, in looking at it, I saw there could be about three 
major areas. But the three major areas are focusing on a kind of a study. And today I'm not going to go into the study per se, but I want to highlight the three major um, plans. So the third point is that the church does not replace the Jewish people. The church has its own mission, and the Jewish people have their mission. In the old matter of salvation, and I'm not naming any church, not naming any organization, I might name one. I had a list that I wanted to bring to our attention, but I'm not going to do it. There are three basic theological perspective that we could look at the church. And three of them are very common and evident around us. The first of the other three is what is called the replacement theology. Does the church replace Israel? So the first theological discourse that takes place around the place is the replacement theology. What does this mean? The replacement theology is that the church and Israel refer to the same group of people. The replacement theology. So it means that once you come to the church, you are a member of the church, you replace Israel, and the two of you now become one. I mean, you now have taken over, and so there's no need for Israel. The second theological discourse is what is called separation theology. In separation theology, it teaches that there are two groups, two different groups of people. So Israel is over there, and the church is over here. So those persons who do new maths, you will not find any coming together of the two. It will be like those two fans. They are separate and apart. The separation theology. And then thirdly, which is a, for me, the last and important is what is referred to as the remnant theology. As far as the remnant theology is concerned, what it means, and those again in new maths, and I'm using maths, you'll find that there is a congress. There's a congress or what you call an overlap. So you draw two circles and one circle over the other. So within the church, you have both Jews and Gentiles. Or within the church, you have Jews and the people of God called the church. Today I want to put it to you that where we stand as a body, we believe that the remnant theology is important. The remnant theology is what we practice. And I want to take us there. In 1962, before I go into any further detail, in 1962 we recognize that the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church believed that every single Jew by birth was responsible for the killing of Jesus and say so they were guilty for the death of Jesus. Up till 1962, the Catholic Church practiced that and believed that. So as far as they are concerned, what took place in Germany in the Holocaust, the Catholic Church supported it. 
a total agreement because you must get rid of these people these people are wicked to be truthful 500 years ago when the church revolved I'm sorry evolved into a new dispensation as a result of the 90 odd theses that were written by Martin Luther Martin Luther himself charged that the, the people of Israel were wicked and if you notice, he didn't want to do anything that had to do with Israel. So instead of, although he objected to the teachings of Rome, Martin Luther became a Baptist. Didn't accept any of the teachings. And if you look at the revolution that took place, the religious re revolution 500 years ago, none of these men came into the church of God, the Seventh-day Church because they didn't want to be seen as what is known as Judaizing. But I want us to recognize, church, that we cannot escape the fact that Israel is crucial in the life of God's church. We cannot escape the fact that Israel is playing a central role in the church of God. Pastor Roach eloquently did it this morning when he points us to the fact that Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. And I want us to there are a few texts I want you to note with me. I'm not going to labor them, but I, because we have said it all this morning, and I want us to look at them, to look at these texts that I have. And so in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28, we recognize that God is saying here, hear what God said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. So you cannot begin to look now at why Jacob's name has been changed. Because he was a supplanter, he had, but now here he prevailed, he struggled. What was supposed to be rightful is, he got it, he prevailed. But let us look at what happened in Genesis 35 and verse 10, which for me is the most pronounced. In Genesis 35 and verse 10, God said, And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he shall be, sorry, so he called his name Israel. I want us to recognize now here is God declaring that Jacob's name is Israel. The descendants of, and if we know this, we know the story very well in Genesis, it was a result of the drought, the famine. 70 of them. Joseph was already down in Egypt. 70 of them had to go down to Egypt and their responsibility, and, and there it was that they went down to Egypt and they, while they were there, they grew into a mighty number. So great the number was that Pharaoh, one of the Pharaohs who did, who enslaved them, he said, look, these people are more than us. I mean, a census must have been done and they knew the count of the Israelites. And what I want us to recognize is slavery and the oppression didn't deny or prevent them from reproducing because God has blessed them and they're going to reproduce. So when, if you consider that they were down in Egypt and they were suffering so badly at the hand of the e Egyptian that all that they could do when they get home at night is to find comfort in their wives. And by so doing, they just continue to have more children. It's a wonderful thing. 
so the children of Israel go. They, they increased at a rate that became threatening to a nation. And so you know the story very well and we, I don't want to go through to bore you today. But I want us to note that Jesus came because one of the things that we must recognize that God wants to do, he wants to have a relationship with all of us. The desire of God is that when he made man, man should have dominion and control over the earth. And because this is paramount in God's mind, it's his objective. It is his vision for the world. He wants us to have a relationship with him. The same brokenness that we spoke about this morning. And so when he did it, with, when he tried Adam, Adam did, Adam failed. Adam failed miserably. Abel was trying, but Abel failed. God tried with Noah, and Noah failed. And all that he have tried with, they failed. When you read the new, when you read the Torah, when you read the five books of the Bible, you begin to recognize how stiff, how stiff naked Israel. Sorry, not the, not the Torah. When you read the after, that the other books of to Malachi that has been given us in the canonization of the Bible. You begin to recognize how Israel was very disruptive. They, they say one thing, but they, mean, but they did something else. And God wanted Israel to be the standard bearer. He wanted them to be the custodian of the law, the rules, the regulation to guide this world. But Israel dropped the ball as a nation. And so in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, we recognize that Jesus now discloses, disclosed rather to his disciples what his purpose and mission is going to be. And in Matthew 16, he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Because God still wants us to find way to him. And so in building his church, the church now must be the vehicle through which we are going to mend the unbroken, I mean the broken relationship. The church, and I heard Brother Blue this morning, and I don't know why I started that way. So, I've, But it's true. But although Jesus was going to build his church, although he came to establish his church, God did not leave Israel out of the plan. Israel is central in the plan. And I want us to look at three, and I'm using three to a great extent today. Three major reasons why God is not excusing Israel out of this plan. The first of the three reason, reasons rather is that Israel has to become a family and it is through that family that Messiah is going to come. So the first major established fact is that Messiah couldn't come to any other group, any other family. To be frank, when he said to Abram in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, Sorry, that was the first prophecy. First prophecy. And I heard Pastor Roach this morning, so I wouldn't even put it, I wouldn't say anything. Sister Daisy was saying it was bruise his he head. But it says crush his head. So if it was bruising the thing. But I want us to look at Genesis 18, because in Genesis 18, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all 
I want us to note here all. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So it is through Abraham, it is through the mighty nation of Israel that all the nations of the earth is going to be blessed. So we can't escape that. So the first thing is that God wanted a family. His duty and his objective and his purpose, his vision, his mission. Well, his mission is to ensure that we work to get there. And his vision is that we all be a part of his glorious kingdom. I heard Pastor Stewart this morning. And, you know, I say yes. Because we have to recognize that the church is central now. In guiding persons to the reconciliation process. The second point that I want to make is that Israel had to be a witness. God wanted Israel to be a witness, a true witness, and let me, let me use the word true witness of God's people. So in other words, they must be his people and they must be a witness to him. And that's why God has demonstrated so many different acts in their vision, in their sight, in their presence, that they can understand who God is. You see, you can't tell me that you know me and you, uh, you can't relate to me. You have to be able to witness. You have to be able to deal with me. And so God wants a people who can talk about him. If you, can't if you don't know God, you can't talk to the world about the brokenness that they're going through. So, so that's one of the purposes that God has established Israel for. For Israel now to become a witness to the world. And the third point that I'd want to leave here is that Israel should be the people the people who would have been preserving the teachings of God so the teachings of God can only be preserved through that group so if you notice we keep the Ten Commandments and all of these all of these are coming out of the relationship with Israel so God is saying to our people Israel is central. Is Israel is central. As we move the process through, we have to recognize that Sinai was also important because we're taking them now out of slavery. The children of Israel now must come out of slavery. To be frank, here is where God is now, I think, this is point number one. God is now saying to the people of Israel, you are now a nation. So they were now established as a free people. You are now a nation. After they got out of Ramesses, the very last point that they left out of Egypt, they now moved into Sinai. There God established some basic principles that must guide the church. And if we notice, these are principles that are still guiding us today. He gave them the Ten Commandments. Now one other thing that we have to look at, when you look at the, the laws of the, that God had given to the children of Israel, and how they added others going through the book of Leviticus, you'll notice that there were roughly another 613 additional laws, some of them for cleansing, some for really how you deal with justice and all these type of things. God laid these down so that his people will be able to deal justly with people around and with themselves. So you and I have to begin to recognize that Israel is central. Israel is central. God used Israel also to establish the priesthood. Because we have to understand that the priesthood, never have any priests before the flood, never have any priests afterward. It was when they came out of Egypt at Sinai, when God was establishing the basic principles of intercession and close relationship with him, that the priesthood, because we're going to need somebody to be the intercessor. 
Somebody have to intercede on your behalf. So as to ensure that when you do wrong, the wrong can be adjudicated in a manner that justice can be dispensed. And so one of the things that we have to recognize that God laid down these basic principles. The third point I wish to make, and I tell you that I'm doing three points. I have about five on this one, but I'm leaving three. Is that God established Israel, and Lord, this one is that He established His tabernacle with His people. Never before did we have it established that the tabernacle of God was with people. And we know that in Revelation, the closing book of the Bible, we know that in Revelation chapter 21, the Bible is now said that the tabernacle of God. And so we know that through Israel, the tabernacle relationship was established. And we're not going to go into what took place and transpired after David took over and his son and the other, other thing. We're not getting into that. When that's one Wednesday night, we come for that. But what is true is that God set up these basic points of references that as a church we cannot escape. And this is why I said that we are the remnant. We, we are not on our own. The church can't be by itself. Neither we are replacing Israel, but we are working with Israel. Crucial. And so, this kind of doctrine is different from what a lot of people preach. And I know that today you would have come to hear a sermon how we're going to march forward. But this is how we march forward. This is how we march forward. And so when the children of Israel got out of Egypt, got to Canaan, and I, I want us to look at some occurrences. These occurrences are important to note. Turn with me to the book of Num Numbers chapter 11. In Numbers chapter 11 and verse 16 and 17, I want you to understand. Now, Moses was instructed by God to choose to look at the leadership now. We're going to establish some elders, some leadership within the group of people that we're transporting. We're moving around. The movement of God's people. We want to look at how we're going to do this. So the Lord instructed Moses to gather to him 70 men of the elders of Israel whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers who over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. I want you to note something here that this is important to know. Here is God now bringing out these men, 70. They are going to be the leaders of the tribes. In other words, these are the people who are respected. They are like the, 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 the done. They are the ones who are in charge. They are the ones who run the various groups. And so God said, I want these men who people will respect and honor and know that they're in charge. And so God said, bring these seven, bring 70. And I want us to go on further. Verse 17 said, then I will come down and talk with you there. So God is now showing that he is willing to have conversation with his people. He wants to talk with them. And this is, welcome Sister Belinda. I didn't see when you walked in here. From that place. I'm sure you'll enjoy it to make a little bit better. So God is coming down to his people to share with them, and, and never before did it happen like this. I want you to look at something. Then I will come down and I will talk with you there. And I will take of the I will take of the spirit. No, I want you to note this now. This is it. For me, the clincher verse of these two. And I'm going to move to the same numbers in a little while. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take off the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them. So I want you to know that the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, 
they got to Sinai and all that God had given them, they didn't yet get the Holy Spirit. The person who had the Holy Spirit was Moses. And what God is now going to do is going to transfer the Holy Spirit from Moses to 70 of the people inside you. I want you take your time with me. Uh, my wife said I mustn't say that I soon finish, but I really soon finish. And I want you to note now that God is saying, and that they will bear the burden with you. Or they will bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. So to lead God people, you're going to need spirit-filled people. And so God is saying now, so, so Israel got out of Egypt, but they did not receive of the Holy Spirit as a people. God is now going to put his Holy Spirit on people, but it was a group, a selected group. These 70. The Holy Spirit will have been laid upon them. Turn with me now. Go, sorry, go down a little bit further now to 24 and 26. And I want us to look at this. So Moses went out and told the people the word of the Lord. And he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Now, if you look at the scripture in this context, he said he gathered the 70. But it's really 68. Really 68. The 70 of them should really be gathered there. But it wasn't the 68, 78 that was present. It was 68 of them. How do I know that? The next verse. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him, Moses here now, and placed the same upon the 70 elders, and it, hap and it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. So what we note is that those 70 elders, when God placed his spirit upon those 70, they were able to do what? Prophesy. The scripture said, though they were not able to do it again. But I want you to know now why I told you it was 68. Let's go to verse 26. But before I go to verse 26, I want you to know now that when the Holy Spirit is on people, it's going to make you behave differently. Sorry, when the Holy Spirit lives within us, it makes us behave differently. And so here these 70 men who now received the Holy Spirit, they now had to behave differently. Verse 26 said, but two men, and that's why I said it was 68, but two men had remained in the camp. They didn't go around the tabernacle as was instructed, but Moses already identified these 70. And so these two didn't go around the camp. The name of one was Edab, or Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. So although they did not go, their names were also offered up. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. I want us to note something. And we, 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 we come under that kind of challenge from time to time. Now they were among those listed but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, No, like Moses never knew. Moses knew, you know. So here the young man went to him and said, He that, sorry, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Look, mysterious. How you get this thing? We, we never see this. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord. And you see him, Joshua, you know. You see him, Joshua. Moses, my Lord. Stop them. In other words, the scripture says, forbid them. Don't let them do it because they're not supposed to do it. They didn't go. But here is God, here is God saying, because they have received of the Spirit, all those who have names were submitted to receive the Spirit, you're going to receive it. 
you and I have to begin to understand that the church is established that we receive what? The Spirit of God. We'll not come to that later. Then Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? Because you know that many of us sometimes is jealous, we get jealous. We see some people doing some wonderful thing in the house of the God, and because we can't do it, we get vexed with them and we they shouldn't do it. Leave the Holy Spirit, let it work. And so here we note that even Joshua, the leader to come, to be come, to, to come was a little jealous so what I want to point you to the, is the fact that when the children of Israel got out of Egypt got to Sinai and they got the laws of God they did not all receive the Holy Spirit they did not all receive the Holy Spirit and that is important if we're going to have eternal life that is important let's move with me now go down to Ezekiel 36 In Ezekiel number 36, verses 22 to 28. Therefore said the house of Israel. Sorry, therefore said to the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God. I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel. But for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nation, wherefore you went. So God is going to give them a take them out of the circumstance, the situation. But God is saying, I didn't do it because you deserve it, but because of my holy name's sake. And I will sanctify my great name, which was being profaned among the nations, which you are profaned in their midst. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, said the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. That is millennial reign we're talking about now, you know. Because God is now going to bring the children of Israel. During that 1,000 year period, God going to bring back the whole house of Israel. Bring back the tent. The, all those who were scattered all over the globe, he's going to bring them back together. And listen what? For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. What a powerful thing. Is the word of God I can't do otherwise. So we have to begin to recognize that once we come into this fellowship, the people of God must understand that Israel is a part of it. Can I skip? Then hear what Ezekiel is saying in verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols I will give you a new heart underline that in your back I will give you a what I will put a new spirit within you I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh so what God is saying oh look you never get the Holy Spirit then. but when I come now and the, the time of the millennial reign and I bring you back because you are my special people. My holy name cannot be profaned. I am a God of covenant. I have a covenant relationship with you. And therefore, I'm not going to let you. You are going to enjoy a privilege with me that no other nation. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7, I'm not going to go there. But what God is saying to them, I didn't take you out because you're in a powerful nation. You're the least among them. But I look here. You have my covenant relationship. And so as a church, let's recognize that Israel plays a very important role in the church. Which of us are happy to be in church today? Are you really happy to be in church? I want us now to look at the church because I was looking at Israel. I want us to look at the church. In Matthew 16 and verse 13, Jesus said, Upon this rock. And we know that there's a lot of this uh, this argument this a little, a lot of argument about this rock business. And we know within the Greek, when the word was used in Matthew, in the Greek language, this rock that they 
Jesus was saying upon this rock was not Petra as Peter would have been translated Petra. So we know that there is, in this case, it was not dealing with the rock, but Peter was the pebble. And so this is why the Roman Catholic uses to say that Peter was the first pope. But we know that according to the word of God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, God never used, I mean, God uses, I mean, the word rock was used to establish Messiah. And in Psalm 22, verse 32, we notice that David also referred to God as his rock. So we can't see rock in this context as any Peter. So what God is saying, upon this Petra, I will establish my Petros. Petros meaning the, the stone, the rock, and Petra meaning the pebble. So Peter being the pebble, Petra, and Petros being the large rock, I will build you upon my rock. So Peter is a little pebble. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Peter now. God reveal it to you that I am the Christ. And so Jesus said, I am establishing my church upon that principle. So in 1 Corinthians, I don't have to go there because I want to finish fast. We notice here that the word church in the Greek meant ecclesias. Or ecclesia. There's a lot of controversy about the translation of this word. But what is true, when it was used in the Greek, it meant a call out of the citizenry. So whenever they were having a meeting in the Colosseum in those places in Greece, then and they have a call out, they, it was regarded as the ecclesia. And the word that was used here is the same word ecclesia, meaning the called out. And I want us to look at something. There is something different about the church and the Israel. When Israel was called out of Egypt, Israel became a nation, but Israel did not receive the Holy Spirit. When Jesus establishes church, come with me. When Jesus establishes church, we know that in Acts 1 and 2, and primarily Acts 2, we know that it did not launch, the church was not really officially launched until the feast. Feast of Pentecost. So Pentecost was the time when the church was officially launched. What happened at that time? The Bible to told me or tells me in Acts chapter 2 and verse 11. Let me go there. Before I go to verse 11. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And something dramatic and significant is going to happen. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as if the rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. I want you to know, in the day of Pentecost, those who were present, the remnant. I'm not going to look at that in a little bit. Those who were present received the Holy Spirit. When Israel was called, it was only the 70 people who received and the 70 prophesied. And we know now that on the day of Pentecost, those who received the Holy Spirit, like those 70 in Israel, they now prophesied. But I want us to look at something here. They came from every region. They came from where? Every region round about. Verse 8 says, And how it is that we hear each in our own language in which we speak. Parthians, 
Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in the metropolis, Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Perga, Pamphylia, those in Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, those who were the ones who were strangers who were engrafted in, who came in to believe the Jewish gospel. And then he continued. Certain, sorry, Cretans and, A and Arabs, we hear them speak in our own language the wonderful word of God. So what we note here in Acts chapter 11, sorry, Acts chapter 2, that men came from all over the place. And they came and they heard the people of God speak in their language. I want to put it to you here that Paul now fix it up nicely in Galatians chapter 3. Because the church now begins to experience an explosion and that's why I tell people that the Feast of Pentecost is really a revival service. It's a time when the, the gospel goes across the world. In Galatians chapter 3, I want you to come with me. Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 to 29. Because Paul now started to get some fight from the children of Israel. The nation Israel. And I'm going to go back there quickly to make a point. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So here is now the church mission. I looked at the mission of the Gleaner Company. Well, I didn't tell the Gleaner Company, but I told the mission of DNG. And I told you the mission of the Church of God, Body of Christ here at 76. Here is what Paul is saying. In seeking to, to achieve the vision of the church, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into... No, I want you to look at the process or the process start. Or the process come. You must be what? baptized into Christ and then you put on Christ and I want us to recognize now church that if we are Jew if we are Israel no problem because as Israelites you can keep all the holy days you know we can keep Purim not the church because the church was not instructed to keep Purim and Hanukkah and all those things but as a nation Israel can keep all these things because they are Israel. But as far as the church is concerned, there's a difference now between Israel physical and the church physical. So hear what verse 28 is saying. There is neither Jews nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. So Paul is now looking at the problem that he was having. Dealing with the children of Israel because they were giving him a fight. In the various churches and so in the church in galatia paul is now saying getting you to understand that once you come in and you have accept christ you're also a jew, a jew we have to understand that but in this case it's a spiritual side not the physical so if i am a jew, as, as i'm an israelite up here and you are not that's not a problem because if this church was a church that had a multiracial group of people and some not come from no Israel and come from Germany and all over the place it no matter we know who we are now once we come into Christ we are one God so as Paul dealt with it in Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 to 22 I'm not going to read all of it so Paul is now saying, nobody argue, nobody go through no holy for trouble and difficulty. Let's get this thing right. Paul is now saying to the Ephesians church, Therefore, 
Remember that you were you you once Gentile in the world. So we were Gentile in the world. I have to note that. So some people might not have been Israel. You might not be from any other tribe. But the fact is that if you were Gentile, non-believer, not part of the Jewish family, hear what Paul is saying. Who were and you were called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision made with flesh by hands that at that time you were without what? You were without Christ. So we have to understand now that the movement is now we are coming into Christ. So the church of vision, mission now and vision is Christ. And so Paul continue. That at a time you were without Christ being alien from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So, Paul is now drawing the thing. We are now brought near through the blood of who? So it's Christ now. The church now has to be established around the principle of Christ. And I don't want us to leave. I want to bring something more. And here we are. And I'm going to put 22 because there's a lot of time. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once were far off, have now been brought nigh by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our who? Our peace was made both one. So in other words, Jews and Gentile. Jews and Gentile. We are now one make both one and I've broken and I've broken down the middle wall of partition having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law commanding sorry, com sorry the law of commandments contained in ordinance so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making what so we have to begin to recognize that the church now is drawn. So Paul is taking time to guide the church. For the church to understand that once you come to Christ, if you are a Jew, no problem, cool. But if you are a Gentile, same way, because you have to remember that when the church was established, Gentile could not come in. Gentile had the part in the church. To be frank, that's why they couldn't receive any benefit to be frank they were in the church have no offices not recognized so Paul had to take a very strategic position he said look here we have to go down to Jerusalem the Jerusalem council because what was happening is that those who were not Jews they had to be circumcised and we could go back to origin from Moses I mean yes Abraham because circumcision started down there so we have to begin now and Paul now took the thing and said look here whether you are Jews or Gentile you are now what? One. That he might reconcile. So here the reconciliation. We might now be what? Reconciled to God in one body through the cross through the cross thereby putting to death the enmity and he came and preached peace so what jesus came now because the church mission is to be light and that's why matthew 5 verse 16 become critical let your the jews were supposed to let the light shine when moses outlined the laws and what god required of them you heard pastor wrote this morning what did he say whatsoever he says we are to do we're going to do it but when it came to the test they couldn't do it they could not do it. And what now enables one to do it is the Holy Spirit of God. So once we have the Holy... You see, let me tell you this. Now. If we are here today and we are wonderful people, we keep the commandments, we do all the feast days and all these things, and, and we don't have the Holy Spirit of God, we are still nothing. I know some churches are Sunday church and they keep all the feast days. You don't mean nothing. Because we're not absorbing the laws God gave to Moses. I mean to the children of Israel. So the, 
Israel are the custodians of God's law. So we can't throw away the law and expect to be serving God. So we have to begin to recognize now that Paul is now, and what we have to know that in Acts, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And so Paul is saying to the Gentiles, look here, uh, let me quickly bring it to a point. Bring it to a point. I want to close quickly. I want to close quickly. In Romans 9, chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Paul got into a serious situation where there was a rejection. Israel was rejecting Christ. Israel was rejecting Christ. And we have to begin to recognize that the church's purpose, the church's mission. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read Romans 9, verses 1, 2, we better stop at verse 5 that all of that text is talking about Israel and a rejection of God and God's purpose and so on but what I want to zero on is zeroing on is that Paul recognized the challenges that the church was going through with Israel because Israel was a very central part of worship there was hardly any synagogue that you could find. Whether you are in the in Thessalonica, in Greece, wherever you were, there were some Jew within the congregation. And when they were opposing what Paul was teaching, Paul had to sometimes beat a hasty retreat. So here is Paul now in verse 9. Sorry, chapter 9, verse 1 of Romans. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For what? For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ. For my who? For my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. So what Paul is saying, because you know Paul declared already that I am a Jew. I am an Israelite. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm proud of it. But Paul is now saying, I wish that what I'm teaching, my brethren could just come and understand. Just learn this with me, no man. Uno just come. I love uno. So he's saying, for I could wish that, sorry, verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pretend the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of promises. Sorry, the giving of the law. The service of God and the promises. Of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ made who is over all the eternal blessed God. So what Paul is here now saying that it is Christ who is coming together to make us into the blessed, into the one that we ought to be. Are you there with me? Verse 6 says, but it is not that the work of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are, nor they, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be, be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as a seed. So in other words, Paul is pointing to the fact that, look here, if you just come in and accept Messiah, you are part of the sin. Don't need to worry yourself when I go on and want to cuss out anybody. No. Come in and recognize that when we come in, Christ died, that we all. Because the, that's what the church is all about. Up on this rock, I will build my... And the gates of hell, because there will be a fight. But the church must remain standing. So the forces of evil will be constantly fighting against the church. But Jesus already established the gates of hell. I want to close off quickly, but come with me to Romans chapter 11. I don't 
don't want to read all of it, but I have 11 from 1 to 6 and 11 to 18. It says, I say then, as God cast away his people, certainly not. For I also am an Israelite. So here's Paul talking. Of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. So God knew him long before all of us. Or do, sorry, all those who were not Israel. Or do you not know that the scripture says of Elijah, whom he plead with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets, have torn down the altars, and I alone am left. And they seek me to, they seek my life. God is saying, look here, it's foolishness to talk here because I have a remnant. God is still what? Protecting Israel. What, but what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself several thousand men who have not bowed to the knee, so I bow their knee to Baal. Even so then, as this present time, there are, there is a remnant according to the election of what? So what, this is why I said that we are, the, the, the theology of the remnant, the remnant theology, that's what we preach. Because we believe that there's a remnant of Israel that is going to be saved now. The bulk of them is going to come at the time of the millennial rule with Messiah. That's God is so God is going to have a marvelous plan for his people. Come another week and we discuss that. Now, here, here we, if I might, in Romans chapter 11 and verse 11 now. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the. So salvation now come to what? So Jews and Gentiles have to live good. Jews and Gentiles must what? You see, Paul, you have to understand, you know, because if Paul didn't do it the way he did it, then we, to be frank, Paul would God had to use Paul because Paul had a major, major challenge with the Jews on one hand and the acceptance of Gentiles on the other hand because Gentiles were not seen as anybody. That's why Peter had to say to Paul at the Jerusalem Council, don't put any heavier weight on them. The only thing I want you to do is not to let them eat any meat that was offered to idols. Because there is a, we have to begin to put them now into context. Because they can't get, through that, get into that and expect that they're going to have worshipping idols and at the same time worship all God. So we have to recognize, church, that God is providing a provision through his church. Israel solid. Israel is what? Solid. But the church is also what? Solid. And so we have to understand now. So, God is now using the church as a vehicle by which everybody is going to come into this reconciliation process. And the reconciliation process is crucial. So then, let's look at what the objective of the church is then. And the vision. So I'll come now. This, the church of God must have a vision. What is the vision? And I put it to you. And this time, I'm, as I close, I have five points. I'm not giving you three this time. I'm giving you five of them. Write down the five of them. The church is a community of people. The church is what? The community of people. Which people? It's God's people. We are God's people. It's a community of who? God's people. And what we are going to find that when Jesus returns, it's the same community of people that will meet him at his coming. I have to recognize that. First, Paul said that the sound of the last trump, the dead in Christ. And those who are alive and what? Remain. Those of the remnant. Those who have been a part, allow Christ, Holy Spirit to dwell within them, to live in their heart. So the purpose of the church is to be the body through which God's people reside in 2nd Corinthians 6 11 hear what Paul is now saying so we have to be a people at one 
O Corinthians, we have spoken open to, openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affection. Now, in return for the same, I speak to children. You also be open. You also be what? So verse 14, Paul is now saying, Do not be unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. For what fellowship of righteousness with, unlaw with lawlessness? And what communion of light with darkness? And so Paul is now telling us that we must now separate ourselves. We must now come out and be what? Separate. And if we are going to be the, pe the church of God, then that is crucial. The, second, the third point, the church is the temple of the living God. The church is where? No, it's not the building I'm referring to. No, we now have become what? The temple of the what? So Paul is now saying that we now become new people by the Holy Spirit living within, within, within us. Amen, church. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. Do you not know that you are who? The temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells where? Who the Spirit of God dwell in? The people who are prepared to allow themselves both Jews and Gentiles. Are you there with me, church? So we have to begin to recognize, do you not know that you are the temple of who? Temple of God. And that the Spirit of God dwells where? And you. That's why when people look at us and they say, they're honest on our Christian. You neither represent Israel nor represent the church. But that's a bad thing. If we are going to represent God, the Spirit of God must live within us. And it must become visible among people that we are the people of God. The third point is that the mission of the church is found in Matthew chapter 8 verses 19 to 20. Thank you, Brother Blue. The mission of the church. Go therefore and make what? Disciples of all. I'm going to nearly do like Mrs. Pelosi. Use my tongue to clean my teeth. Go therefore and make disciples of where? All nations. That's one of the purpose of the church. The mission of the church. Baptizing them in the name of the who? Because we're going to bring more people into Israel. That's the only way we're going to come in. By baptism now. Teaching them to observe all things. Baptizing them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Teaching them to observe all things. That I have commanded you. And lo, I will be. So when you, you, you how we want Christ to be with us, we have to become a part of that. Part of that major throne. So the church is to preach. Let me leave you with the fourth point. And leave. I'm exhausted my welcome. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. That's the fourth point. And I leave you with that. Well, no, I'm not going to leave you with that. I'm going to leave you with the fifth one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, hear what Paul is now saying. And it is important for us to know that. We are supposed to be ambassadors. We are supposed to be what? You know who ambassadors are? People are living in a strange country, representing another country. And we are people from an... We are representing Christ. And so hear what Paul is saying. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though, and so Paul is now saying, although we are ambassadors for Christ, look at the gravity of it now. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be what? Reconciled to God. Are you there, church? So Paul is encouraging us that um, as ambassadors, our job must to go out there to do what? Reconcile. Help the broken up pieces. Put on back the 
put on back the the cup handle but don't put it in the microwave because if you suffer with him you're going to rule with him because when the time is a short thing you know we don't want to suffer but we have to do what? suffer with him and so I close now with 2 Timothy 2 And I closed Sister Roche with that very point. I wasn't going to bring it, but I said, let me just bring it because you bring it up. Remember, sorry, and I'm reading now the final text, 2 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 12, the mission of the church. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. All writing. So according to the gospel that Christ, that God gave him, the Messiah, he is sharing that because of all the persons of Paul was a rough man. Paul will lick down anybody who not saying what he's saying. But here is Paul accepting Messiah. And he's saying now, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. So because I draw a line, I decide to step away and to recognize Messiah and the purpose of his church as suffer as an evildoer. Even to the point of they lock me up and put me in chain. But the word of God is not chain. So although they want to lock me up, no problem. The word of God is still what? Free. Not change. Verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the what? Of the elect. I endure all things. I suffer all things. Sorry, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvaging. That they may obtain the what? The salvaging which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. They are going to experience the what? Salvaging. Pastor Roach will tell you as a fireman fireplace are burned down and sometimes you go into some wonderful things and you are salvaging that's what salvation all of us would have been in trouble but Jesus but the Messiah Jesus has come hallelujah that they also may obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory and just in case you believe, I'm telling you a lie. And just in case you didn't believe, Paul. Paul continued. This is a faithful saying. For if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, though, he also. May we look at the vision of the church. May we look at the mission of the church. God has not thrown away Israel. Israel is crucial in God's plan. But the church's objective is to ensure that we accept Messiah. Live Messiah life. So that when he comes, I heard when Sister Nika said, I shouldn't be the one saying it. But he will then say to those of us now. Because it, in, when Jesus returns, you know, there's going to be another tr a new thing going to happen. If God loved this world. And so many people going the wrong way. You think you're not going to find a way to save the world? But it's for another time. May God bless you as you hear his word. Hard not your heart. Because there won't be a second chance for those who hear his word. God bless you. Thank you very much. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord. Hallelujah. So we have been getting some history lessons. And um, some, of, some, of it, some of us know already, but this is very important information, brethren, to know where the church of God is coming from. And to know that we still acknowledge our brothers and sisters who are also part of this body of Christ. Amen. Bless the Lord. And for those who have not submitted their lives to the Lord, 
you hear what you need to do repent and be baptized and you too can be a part of this body where you'll receive the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth amen can you stand with me now and join us while we sing hymn number 61 to close I just want to say special thanks to Bishop Chambers for allowing the Holy Spirit to lead him in the way he did. And after the singing of this song, we're going to invite Pastor Stewart to do the closing prayer. Hymn number 61. Our Father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the holy true God, the one who called the hand from the beginning, you alone, great God, who sits high and looks low, you alone that spans the heavens and lay the hearts upon its foundation. We pray, great God, and ask that your hear will now be attentive to the prayer and to the supplication of your servants. As we acknowledge, great God, that as a people, like sheep, we have all gone astray. But here we are, eternal God, humbling ourselves before your mighty throne at this time. And asking you, great God, that you remember the request that your servant Solomon 
have made unto you and you have promised to honor him. That if we as a people that who are called by your name will just humble ourselves, break God and repent of our sins, then you will show us mercy by removing it from us. And so here we are as we gather before your throne, even this day. We pray, great God, that you'll help us to remember the great goodness that you have shown to us as a people, lest we forget that you have brought us out and delivered us from our enemies with a mighty hand. Great God, you have let us experience the wilderness, great God, experience that you have provided for us, eternal God, food from above. You have given us, eternal Father, water from the rocks. Father, you have protected us from our enemies, that no weapon that form against us that ever prosper. And here we are, great God, that you have brought us into the land that you have promised our fathers. Father, you have fortified us. You have put a fence around us. You have built a tower in the midst of us. Father, but when you look for us to produce good grapes, we, great God, have produced wild grapes. We have rejected you, the fountain of living waters. Father, we have cast our backs upon your laws. And so because of that, we are now under the curse of being written by your servant, Daniel. And so we ask, great God, that you remember us now and forgive us of our sins. As we stand before you this day, we thank you, great God, for the mercies that you have shown us, that you have bring us to the close of one here. And now to the beginning of another, we pray, great God, as we humble ourselves, and as we seek your kingdom and all its righteousness, may you grant us, great God, the measure of your Holy Spirit, that we will live by heavy words that proceed out of your mouth, and that you will supply our needs according to your riches in glory. Father, your people who stand before you this day, you know their heart's desire, eternal God. You know, great God, the troubles, the trials, the tribulation, whatever it is that they are going through on an individual basis, you know it. Is. And so, Father, we ask, great God, that you will supply their needs. Where there is hatred, we pray, great God, that you will replace it with love. Father, where there is sorrow, great God, we pray that you will replace it now with joy. Eternal God, we pray, great God, that reconciliation will now take place where there is separation. And we pray, great God, that the spirit of love may be seen amongst your people. That wherever we go, great God, that the world will see that we are your disciples indeed. Father, hear and answer our prayer, we pray. We thank you for how you have used your man's servant today to present your words. Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless him. Remember his family. We pray a special prayer for his wife and his daughter, who you know are not in the best of health. But may you, great God, reward them greatly for their faithfulness in even turning up in your sanctuary today to give you honor and to give you glory. May you be a blessing to them, Lord. We pray for your leaders of this congregation, also Pastor Roach and his family, eternal God. May you continue to bless him. May you continue to strengthen him, eternal God, that he will lead your people in the path of righteousness that they should go. And may you continue to be with your people. Bless all those who see it fit to obey your words, eternal God, to attend, Father, your sanctuary today. May you reward them greatly, eternal Father. And may you help that as they leave from this place that their lights will shine, that men may see their good works and glorify you who part in heaven, which is the purpose of our calling, eternal Father. Hear and answer our prayer. May you bless, great God, the food that we are about to partake. May you help, great God, that our storeroom and our basket may never be empty as we seek to give you thanks. May you dismiss us now with the choicest blessings, eternal God. And whatever we fail to ask, we pray, great God, that you fail not to grant it unto us. May Christ, our intercessor, continue to intercede on our behalf, knowing that, great God, without him, we are nothing. Father, may you keep us, eternal Father. May you not cast us away from your presence. May you not take your Holy Spirit from us. May you not blot our name from your book of life. But may you help each and every one of us that at the coming of Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we will all be found worthy. And here, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter he into thy kingdom. 
It has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And we'll all rejoice when Christ and his Father will tabernacle with men. We bless your name, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks. We give you the glory and we give you the honor as we say thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We praise the Lord. We bless the Lord. Just want to give the Lord thanks for the way in which he has led us today, the way in which he has ministered to us, and for bringing each and every one of us here together, some from near, some from far, to praise his name and to receive that which he had to say to us. And we're going to ask now that you have heard the word to go forth and be a doer of the word. Thank you for being here. The Lord bless you. Please stand now for the benediction. Benediction. You know, may the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the full fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us all, both now and forever. Amen.
Just me. 